things. And Lord, would you speak to us now as we come to your word. We thank you for the privilege of coming to scripture to hear the very words of God and have them change us and challenge us. We pray that uh, despite my rambling, Lord, that you would do that clearly in us today. We thank you that we can come together and hear your word preached. Please bless us in this time now we ask. Amen. Let's read then. Mark chapter 3, beginning verse 20. You remember that in these last couple of weeks, Jesus has stirred up a lot of controversy, we've seen. Uh, Ryle in the Pharisees and the scribes, calling himself the Lord of rest, the Lord of the Sabbath, to the point where they are plotting to kill him. And, and then all the crowds were gathering around him and, and crushing him, and he called aside 12 to do join him in his work of preaching uh, and healing and casting out demons. And now we have some time later from verse 20. Jesus entered a house, probably back in Capernaum, and the crowd gathered again so that they were not even able to eat. When Jesus' family back in Nazareth heard this, they set out to restrain him because they said, he's out of his mind. Meanwhile, the scribes who had come down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebub. And he drives out demons by the ruler of demons. So he summoned them and he spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And so if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But he's finished. No one could enter a strong man's house and plunder his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for all sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. Back to our first scene. Jesus' mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him and told him, Look, your mother's brothers and your sisters are outside asking for you. He replied to them, Who are my mother and my brothers? Looking at those in the circle around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Mark is taking us on this journey then of, uh, of asking this question, who's Jesus? Just who is he? No one seems to get who he is. We've seen that time and again, haven't we? And, and today we see that same thing, more misunderstanding about who Jesus is and more than just about who he is, but who the source of his power is or where his power comes from. And this is vital, Mark is showing us, because how we view Jesus and who he is is going to define whether we are inside or outside whether we are in his family or whether we are outside of the household, out in the cold. And the terms Mark presents us with then are pretty black and white. It's in and out. You're with Jesus or you're not. You're for him or against him. Anyone who responds to Jesus with faith and by following, you are in Jesus' kingdom family. But there are those who don't recognize him. They don't believe that Jesus has come in the power of God's Holy Spirit. And so they figure that when he claims to forgive sin, when he commands sicknesses and diseases, when he drives out demons, he is either some insane man or he is evil. Some of you will have heard this quote a number of times, I'm sure, this argument from C.S. Lewis from his book, Mere Christianity. And I'm sure when he wrote this, he must have been reading these verses. Because Lewis argues you can't simply get away with saying Jesus was a good man, a nice man, a good moral teacher. He says this, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus says would not be a great moral teacher. 
He would either be a lunatic on a level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, like his family are trying to do, or you can spit at him and call him a demon and kill him as a demon, as the scribes are looking to do. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronising nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that option open to us, and he did not intend to. Lewis's point is this. If we look at Jesus' own words and his actions, they're completely at odds with this world. They don't fit in even with what this world thinks of as good and moral. He claimed to be a king of a heavenly kingdom. He brought an explosive new way of, of coming into the kingdom of God and coming into relationship with God. He claimed to be superior to the law, for it all to be pointing and fulfilled in him. He claimed to have an authority on a par with God to be able to forgive sins. These aren't comfortable moral teachings, they are claims to be God. And so if Jesus isn't God, Lewis says, you've got two options left. He was either mad, a lunatic, or he was the devil himself, possessed by demons, under the influence of Satan. But if what Jesus says and does is being done by the power of the Holy Spirit, then we must believe that he is who he claims to be. To refuse that, as we see today, puts us on very dangerous ground. To set yourself up against God in defiance of all the evidence is to willingly stand outside God's family. So let's look at the text. Let's look uh, at verse 20. Jesus entered a house. As I say, he's back probably in Capernaum. This is probably uh, Simon Peter's mother-in-law's house. This is where he performed that miraculous healing and where he's been based. And again, the crowds gather. This time, so many of them, and there's so much going on, and it's such a chaotic scene, Jesus isn't even able to eat. It's a familiar scene to us, but Mark is using it as a setup for what comes next. Because we sort of switch in our minds out of the chaos of the crowds in the house to Jesus' sleepy little hometown of Nazareth. Back in Nazareth, in verse 21, his family heard this. They set out to restrain him because they said, he's out of his mind. Imagine you're in Jesus' human family, one of his brothers or sisters. You grew up with him. You know him well. But something's changed in this last year. You've hardly seen him round anymore. Jesus is your big brother. He's the oldest son, but... He jacked in his job. There's no money coming back from him to support the family, and, and Joseph probably is, has passed away. Jesus went out one day to see John the Baptist at the River Jordan. He went to get baptised by him, and then he just never came home. Think about Mary, his mum. She knew that Jesus was special in God's plans. She couldn't forget the wonder of her pregnancy and, and, the, and the wonder of Jesus' birth and God's promises to her. And yet, she's looking at her son, her firstborn, and thinking, is he going off the rails? He's not eating properly, I've heard. He, he's not got a job. He's staying in other people's houses. He's deliberately making the religious leaders angry. He's saying and doing things that only God can do. And now there are assassination plots out there. He's in constant danger. He's getting such chaotic crowds following him. Who knows what's going to happen? Surely he's gone mad. Surely he's out of his mind. But if we can bring him back home, if we can just get him back to Nazareth and back in the family home, we can try and talk some sense into him, settle him back into normal life. Maybe we can sympathise with Jesus' family a bit. They're worried for him, concerned, possibly a bit embarrassed at the things that are being said about him. And if his brothers are like most brothers, they're probably pretty angry with him as well and disappointed at the way he's behaving. And so the family set out 20 miles from Nazareth to Capernaum to get Jesus to restrain him and to bring him home. Mark is showing us there's another group of people 
who are opposed to Jesus. They are outside of the kingdom. They're looking to put a stop on his ministry. And the shock is it's Jesus' own family. They didn't understand who he was or what he'd come to do. Now Mark pauses the story here. He does this for dramatic effect. If this was a film, we'd have seen them make their plans and set out and then the scene would cut. We'd be back at Capernaum with the chaos and the crowds and perhaps it would say meanwhile. Meanwhile. Just as word had got back to Jesus' family, so word had got down to Jerusalem of all that Jesus was doing. And so some scribes, the big guns, come up. They're concerned. They're intrigued. They want to see who this controversial Jesus is. Look at verse 22. The scribes who had come down from Jerusalem said, this is their conclusion after watching his ministry, he is possessed by Beelzebul, that is by the devil or by uh, a ruling demon. He drives out demons by the power of Satan, by the power of the ruler of demons. Their accusation is clear. Jesus is under the control of the devil. Satan has come into him and inhabited his soul and is using his physical body as a channel for his evil power. And so, if this sounds a bit wacky to you, it did to Jesus too. He asked them a question. And then he uses three pictures to just show them how wrong they are. Do you see his question there in verse 23? How can Satan drive out Satan? It's a rhetorical question. They're meant to go, well, Satan can't drive himself out, can he? That sounds a bit, sounds a bit mad. He can't do that. And Jesus is looking at these scribes and saying, you're the big guns, aren't you, from, from, from Jerusalem? You're, you're the ones who are meant to be smart, to get this. Think about it for a second. Why would a ruler like Satan use his own powers to destroy himself? If Satan's plan is to destroy Jesus and to destroy God's people and to destroy God's creation, why would he self-sabotage it when he's doing such a good job? Why would he cast his own demons out from people? And so Jesus gives these couple of pictures to help make this point. He says, think about a kingdom. To remain powerful, that kingdom must remain united. If the kingdom is divided, then it ends up in in civil war. If the actions of the king cause division and disunity among his people, the cracks start to show. When the cracks show in the great western railway trains, they can no longer run. We see this kind of pressure in the UK at the moment, don't we? Some politicians trying to keep the country together, some fighting for independence, and there's tensions over race and class, and it all leads to to a sense of division in the country. It's the same with a household, Jesus says. You think of a family. Maybe think of our royal family after, I don't know, the revelations about Prince Andrew or the interview with Harry and Meghan. The fallout is damaging, isn't it? It shows a household divided, struggling to be united together. The question asked in the days that followed after that television interview was, how long can the monarchy last? How long can it stand and keep going? This is the point Jesus is making in verse 26. If Satan rises up against himself, he's going to divide his kingdom and it's going to fall. Satan is not that stupid. He hasn't done that. He's fighting strong. In verse 27, Jesus is saying that to them. You've got it wrong. Satan isn't driving his own demons out. Here's what's really going on. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Satan is the strong man. Let's not fool ourselves that he was weak. He had a great deal of power over people, as we saw, and that's what Jesus was dealing with. He let loose his power and authority on earth in violent and destructive ways. And so to defeat him, to leave him with nothing, he first needs to be restrained. And Jesus says, that's what I've done. I'm superior to Satan in every way. I am stronger than the strong man. You're watching me right now when I cast out demons and heal sicknesses. You're watching me tie him up and run riot in his house. He's met his match in me. 
He's finished. He's not going to be able to stand after this. But it is not by his own power because that is ridiculous. It is by the power of God. We can't then ignore what comes next in verses 28 and 29. Difficult verses to understand. You'll be patient with me. We'll try our best. Truly I tell you, Jesus looks at the Pharisees, the scribes, and no doubt the crowds and says, people will be forgiven for all sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Why is he saying this to them? The, the crux of the matter seems to be this, verse 30, because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. He's possessed by the devil. I don't know, but here's the closest I think I can get to it in terms of a, of a human example. Maybe someone has done something to you. They've hurt you terribly. They've truly hurt you. And there's a willingness in your heart to forgive them. But they won't admit that they have done anything wrong. They won't admit that they've sinned against you. They're convinced that their conscience is clean. And so they take the high ground and they are defiant and obstinate. And because they won't accept that they've done anything wrong to hurt you, they refuse to accept your forgiveness. You might be willing to forgive them, but they refuse to take it because they've taken this stand and refuse to admit they have done anything wrong. In fact, they start to accuse you of being in the wrong. The problem is hard hearts. And so what I think is going on here is this. Jesus is describing the hard hearts of the scribes. He's already been grieved at the hard hearts of the Pharisees in that Sabbath incident. These scribes have somehow managed to get themselves into such a place of hatred, their hearts couldn't be further from finding out who Jesus really is. Not only do they not recognize him, but they're actively saying that the Holy Spirit of God, the source of Jesus' power, is satanic and evil. That's where their hearts have got to. They hate the only one who is willing to forgive them for their sin. In that sense, they're unforgivable because they have set themselves up like a solid wall against the forgiveness of Jesus. They refused to have faith in him. Is there anything that God can't forgive or isn't willing to forgive? I don't think there is. Is there anything that is outside of the power of Jesus' blood shed on the cross for the forgiveness of sins? I don't believe there is. The problem doesn't lie with what God can or can't do or the effectiveness of Jesus' blood. The problem lies in the heart of the people who refuse to receive forgiveness. Truly, I tell you, Jesus says, people will be forgiven for all sins, whatever blasphemies they utter. That's a categorical statement. So what's the difference? Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, looking at Jesus and his source of power and saying, that is satanic, that is devilish. You are willfully refusing to come to Jesus in faith. They hate Jesus so much, they would speak the worst offenses against the Holy Spirit with joy in their hearts. God speaks like this in the Old Testament too. It's just one example from Numbers 15. Just to give us a sense of the fact that Jesus, that, that God does say there is forgiveness and yet you can cut yourself off too. Listen to these words from Numbers 15. If one person sins unintentionally, he's to come and present a sin offering. The priest will make atonement before the Lord on behalf of this person who's acted in error by sinning unintentionally. And when he makes atonement for him, he'll be forgiven. But the person who acts defiantly blasphemes the Lord. That person is to be cut off from the people, put outside of the family of God. He will certainly be cut off. Why? Because of something has God done? No, because he has despised the Lord's word and broke his command. His guilt remains on him. Do you see in the Old Testament, there's this picture as well of God saying, that it is possible that you can be so defiant against God that you put yourself out of the family of God. You put yourself out. I think that is what is happening here. And so you might be a Christian and you might have worried about this. Have I ever committed the unforgivable sin? The fact that you are even thinking that means you haven't. 
Yeah, just the fact that you are concerned for your state before God proves that you haven't committed that sin. That your heart is sensitive to be right before Jesus, to be righteous in his sight, to want to know his amazing grace and his forgiveness means you are not in that category. And how wide is God's grace for us? It's endless, isn't it? Endless, amazing grace. You think about Paul. You think about how terribly he behaved. He describes it in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He says, I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an arrogant man. But even Paul wasn't beyond the pale. He says, I received mercy because I acted out of ignorance in unbelief. And the grace of the Lord overflowed along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. You think of the awful things Paul did, standing and gloating as Stephen was stoned to death, seeking permission to arrest and and separate families and, and kill. Even Paul's blasphemy against God, even his hatred of Jesus and his followers was not enough to separate him from God's grace. And so that should show us how bad a place the scribes are in that Jesus are meeting now. They're not ignorant, as Paul says he was. This is deliberate. This is defiant. They're setting him up, setting themselves up against God, and they are blaspheming, they are slandering, they are speaking against the Holy Spirit. Sorry, I need to keep going. What Jesus is describing here, isn't it, is the fate of the outsider. We've seen these two different things. He's mad or he's evil. And to think either of those things means you have put yourself on the outside. Jesus' blood is enough to forgive all and any and every sin. But our hearts, we can set them up in opposition to him. And if we are not willing to accept forgiveness and come to him in faith, then we don't receive forgiveness. Jesus calls this eternal in verse 29. This is They're guilty of an eternal sin. What he means by that simply is when they die and they stand before God and they realize that Jesus was the son of God, it's too late for them. It's too late for them. Mark takes us back. We kind of get this sandwich effect. We've seen Jesus' family. We've seen the problem with the scribes. And now we come back to Jesus' family. Having painted the picture in more detail, we see the seriousness of the situation of being outside. Look at verse 31. His mother and his brothers came. Standing outside, they sent word to him. They called for him. And a crowd was sitting around with him in the house. And they told him, look, your mother, your brothers, your sisters, they're all outside. And they're asking for you. How does Jesus respond? Again, it's with a question, isn't it? Do you notice how often he does that? Who are my mothers, my mother and my brothers? What would the answer be? What would we expect that to be for those inside? Jesus, we just told you. It's them. They're outside. They're asking for you to come out and talk with them. They're worried about you. They say you're not well. They want to take you home. That's your family. But what does Jesus do? He goes to the window, perhaps. He looks out. He sees his family out there. His sisters crying and pleading with him to come out. His brothers shouting and getting angry and Mary holding them back. No, 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 calm down. Let him come out of his own accord. Perhaps his heart breaks a little. He walks away from the window, comes back amongst those who are in the house with him. He realises his own family at this point are outsiders. He looks at those in the circle around him and he says... Here, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and my sister and my mother. It's you guys. You're my family. We're we're coming in to close. I want to see a couple of quick ways that I think this might have an impact for us today. For many of you, I, I don't know all your family situations, the blessings, the dysfunctions. Some of you, I'm sure, either in this room or watching on the video or listening on the CD, will have been abandoned or abused or adopted. Others feel greatly alone. They've lost all their family members. Others are bullied and belittled. 
Some of you are under great pressure in your families because of your faith. You know the pain of having a partner or children or parents who don't believe. Jesus knew these kinds of rejections too from his own family. Family life can hold many joys and delights, can't it? But for some, dealing with our families is just a hugely painful experience. And I believe these words of Jesus can bring such hope into those hard situations. You see, when you accept God's grace, you enter into a new family. Whatever the state of your human family, when you come to Jesus, you come into a, a more perfect family, a divine family. A family of billions spread across space and time. The most important, profound family that has ever existed. It is more important than our earthly families even. How do we come into that family? Paul says, by the spirit of adoption. When you put your faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you and you become adopted into God's family. Whatever your family situation today, can I just encourage you? If you put your faith in Jesus, you are part of a family. You are part of a different family, a divine family. Is Jesus calling us to prioritise his family above our families? Well, I think in a sense he is, isn't he? He affirms earthly families. God created the family. He calls us to honour our parents and to bring up our children to know him. But our earthly families are temporary. Our heavenly family goes on into eternity. Maybe that means for some of us today we need to prioritise. I really realise that this could be even uh, quite offensive teaching to some. Imagine being Jesus' family outside the house and hearing word of what he'd said inside. This is my family. Jesus loved his family, but he couldn't let them become uh, uh, divisive for his call to, to obey God. He didn't let them become more important than his kingdom family. They were welcome to come to him, but they couldn't divert him from what he was doing. We might think it's offensive. How can Jesus say my human family is less important than my heavenly family? Well, Here's an, an example of where the rubber hits the road on that. And we see this in the persecuted church across the world. I was speaking to someone this week whose Muslim friend has come to trust in Jesus. And for that person, it means coming inside the house to sit at the feet of Jesus, coming into Jesus' family. But it literally means being abandoned by their human earthly family. This is the real cost sometimes of coming in to God's family. And this is where the church comes into play, isn't it? And this is, this is the last main thing I want us to think about. This is where the church comes into play. We are the family of God. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I want to say, if you are not yet in the family of Jesus, remember that C.S. Lewis quote I read earlier, you can shut Jesus up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. They're really your only options. I want to encourage you, if you recognise from these verses today that you are outside of Jesus' family, then you can come home. There's grace for you. You can come inside. You can recognise the Holy Spirit is the source of Jesus' power. You can receive healing and forgiveness. You can fall at his feet and call him Lord. You can sit at his feet and learn how to do God's will. And if you've never had a family or your family is dysfunctional, then here is where you can find belonging, in the family of Jesus. And so that's a challenge for us as a church as well, isn't it? We affirm we're Jesus' family, we're those inside the house sitting at his feet, but I want to ask, uh, for an outsider looking in, what would they see of Bethel today? What would they see of the church in Bedworth? And Drew Thomas and Machen. What would they see of the church in Wales, in the UK? What would they see looking in at us? What does Bedworth see in us? I wonder, do, do we look any more like Jesus' family, like a good, loving family, than perhaps those who gather at the local pub or on a sports team? I think some of those gather more frequently than we do. 
and not reluctantly or complaining, but with enthusiasm and drive and passion for why they're meeting. Maybe there's evidence that they love one another more than we do. Are they more honest with one another than we are? Do they give more of their commitment and their time and their money than we do to further God's will and work in this place? God forbid that they look more like Christ than us. I just, I can't fathom it. These questions should give us cause to think. Each one of us here united in Christ, adopted into his family. How can we dare risk not doing God's will by acting like it? We have a responsibility to look at ourselves. And I'm sorry, I realise I've gone through all of this without giving you anything on the screen, even though I was having real fun with some clip art and whatnot. But let me ask these three diagnostic questions we consider as people look in at us. What do they see? Let's ask ourselves, am I taking my full place in the life of the family? Is church just a hobby to you, an inconvenience, a bit of a frustration? Are these people around you slightly annoying acquaintances that you've got to put up with because you go to Bethel? What does Jesus say is the only evidence that you are in Jesus' family is that we do the will of God. And in our context, what's that going to look like? It's going to look like praying together, seeking Jesus together, enjoying fellowship together, loving one another until it hurts, putting up with our differences, showing grace and patience and serving one another. It's going to look like giving to the ministry of God's word. It's going to look like crying and rejoicing together. It's going to look like encouraging one another, taking part, being generous, being patient, letting go of our pride, letting go of our rights, letting go of our petty grievances and frustrations. It means loving Jesus, taking his words seriously and putting them into practice in the life of the church no matter what. Some of us know that we need this because we come from situations where we've never had this before. Others of us are busy. And we're quite comfortable, comfortable enough that some of these things are optional extras. So we can ask, what is it that means I don't want to fellowship with my family? What is it that means I don't want to join to pray with them? What plans are more important to me than coming and sitting at Jesus' feet and hearing his word preached or studying it with my brothers and sisters? What reasons have I got for withholding my time or my money or my gifts to serve Jesus and do the will of God? For some of you, this won't be an issue. For others, this is a helpful diagnostic question. For me, this is a helpful diagnostic question. Second question, do I love this family that Jesus has given me? It kind of connects in, doesn't it? Are we loving one another as Jesus' family should? What would the outside world say? What would they say? Do we look like we are loving one another with costly, sacrificial, Christ-like love? Do you have patience and grace for those in the church who have hurt you? Are you willing to forgive and serve and care? We serve in one another as Jesus' family should. I'm going to leave that there for you to ponder in the last one. Am I being honest with others? Because connected with being able to love and serve one another as we need is simply this. If we're not being honest with one another, we don't know what our needs are. If you're not honest with someone in this church about what your physical needs are, what your fears are, what your doubts are, what your struggles with sin are, then I'm sorry, we're not being the family of Jesus we're called to be. Who are you confessing to? Who are you praying with? Who are you seeking support from? that we might do the will of God and be brothers and sisters to one another. And I get it because sometimes our fear of judgment stops us from being family. We get, well, what will people think if I admit to this or if I acknowledge this? Sometimes our pride is what prevents us. Not our fear, but our pride. I must keep up appearances. We're all sat here with our masks on. In a sense, I want to say, take your mask off. Not your physical mask, but your spiritual mask. What is it achieving? Let's pursue truth and intimacy together, warts and all. 
I don't want to be a part of a church that plays make-believe, do you? Take it seriously. We must take it seriously together. There's a lot going on in these verses, isn't there? I'm sure I could say more, and I'm sure you're willing me to stop. I think I should. But I'm going to leave these questions for a moment for you to have a think, and I'll put them on the video as well, on the screen of the video, if you want to go and find them again afterwards. The point of this is not that we come away feeling that we're guilty or that we are doing things wrong. The point of it is this, that it drives us. It draws us back to the feet of Jesus. It draws us back to see him. It draws us back to look at Christ, the, his love displayed at Calvary, his sacrifice for us, that we might become his brothers and sisters and say, how now can we live in any less generous a way? We need the power of the Holy Spirit, the same as Jesus did, don't we? And so we're going to come and use this song uh, as, uh, as a chance to reflect before the service closes. Holy Spirit, I'll put the words up. Living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul. Let the presence of the risen Lord come and renew my heart and make me whole. Cause your word to come alive in me. Give me faith for what I can't see. Give me passion for your purity. Holy Spirit, breathe new life in me. Let's use this hymn as a prayer to respond to God's word this morning.